good to us. Uh, you can be seated. I'd like my wife to sing. She uh, usually the best part of the show anyhow, so I'll let her sing. But, uh, man, is it good to have the Buxtons back home or what? <clears throat> I got so excited this afternoon when I heard uh, Jazzy and Sheba running around up there and fussing at each other, fussing at everything to move. <laughs> They're back. And uh, I sure love this, love this good elder and his wife and uh, greatly, greatly appreciate this church. I, I, honestly, honestly, I, I have wondered, man, did, did Pastor Buxton tell all these people to be so nice to us or, or what? I mean, they send an email throughout the church, or what's the deal, man? These people are so nice, and I'm serious. I really thought that. Uh, but you folks are so such a good people, and when um, Sister uh, when Sister Watkins was saying what a what a what a what a good church this is, I, I thought, well, she she hit that right on the nail on the head. Go, this is such a good, powerful moving of God church where the Spirit of God is. You know we're wasting our time if the Spirit of God is not here. Oh, praise the Lord. We just will go join the social function somewhere. <laughs> I need God. How about you? Let's worship the Lord. that we've been here has been such a blessing to us. But I'm thankful that I'm living to the Lord and living for the Lord. And like Brother Buxton was saying earlier, he was telling about the man in Peru. But God is faithful to us. Even when we don't know how things are going to work out, we can trust in Him and His faithfulness. And I'm thankful for that. Every time I come back, people waiting. 
serve a faithful God tonight. His faithfulness, His compassions are new with every morning. Tomorrow morning you wake up, you're going to have a new, new plate of mercy and grace on your hands. He's faithful to us. And uh, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Luke. And, well, first let's go to uh, Psalm chapter 63. Psalm chapter 63, and then we'll go to Luke chapter 5, Psalm 63, verse 1, and then Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. And I want to say how much we appreciate the Buxtons in this church and the local ministry and just everybody, and I mean that. Psalm 63 and 1, if you've got it, say praise the Lord. David writing, and he says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see, not to hear it, but to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. He already said that in the morning early will I seek thee. And when I go to bed, I've still got you on my mind, God. I'm thinking about you in the morning. I'm thinking about you at night. Verse 7, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul follows hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. While you're in Psalms, skip over to uh, chapter 68 real quickly. And verse 31. Psalm 68 and 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. For, uh, Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Last few verses here and we're done. Luke 5 and 4. Dr. Luke is writing and he says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a drought. Simon answering and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Singular. It was not God's word. Jesus said, let down the nets. Plural. He said, oh, I'll do what you're saying. I'll let down your net. Singular. It wasn't God's word. Let's keep reading. And when they had this done, what? Let down the singular net. They enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net, singular break. Let me pause right here. Tenses mean something to God. And you get in trouble when you don't pay attention to a tense of what God says. This shows that. He said, nets, plural. And they got in trouble when they ignored the tense. And there's a lot of people getting in trouble today when they ignore the tense of baptize in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy. Tenses mean something to God. 
And the whole thing's falling apart because they're not paying attention to the tense of the singular tense. The name. Aren't you glad that you know what that name is tonight? Real quickly, verse 7. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships. So they began uh, to sink. Skip down to verse uh, 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. That's my title tonight. Forsaking all to find him. Forsaking all to find him. God bless you. You can be seated. Some time back, I, uh, I read a missionary's true recount of the early days of mass revival in Ethiopia. In fact, I uh, spoke with Sister Nona Freeman prior to her, her death and asked her about some of this, uh, some of this stuff I had read. Uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just a stickler for facts. I want to make sure to dot my I's and cross my T's. And so I spoke with her, and in her frail voice, she said, Yes, Brother Perkins, every bit of that is true. She said, I was there. She said, Every, every bit of it is true. And, uh, and, and we talked for quite some time about some of this stuff I want to tell you about. But this book goes into great detail of the origin and the roots of the revival. It chronicles the early Trinitarian persecutions and the attacks and the fires on the Jesus-named people. And how that God repeatedly and literally, literally sent angels to protect and to deliver his people from house fires, etc., etc. On and on it goes, uh, started by Trinitarians attacking the Jesus name people. It tells of a man's conversion who uh, is now in false doctrine and later went into uh, false doctrine, in fact, uh, I, I do not in any way, shape, or form consider this man saved to this day. He's completely backslid, in my opinion, and is in false doctrine. But uh, I don't want to deal with that part tonight. I don't want to deal with that, though I'd like, though I could. But it tells of a man by the name of Tecla Merriam's conversion out of Trinitarianism and into the biblical truth of the oneness of the Godhead and Jesus' name, baptism. Of course, again, this was prior to the doctrinal errors and deviations that he now embraces, which, again, I'd really like to address, but I did, I'm just going to move on from that. I don't want to deal with that part tonight. Uh, but at one time, at one time, he was used mightily in those beginning days in the establishment of truth in Ethiopia. He would spend his days in prayer, Bible study, and fastings, Very often, he would pray through the night up until the dawn of the day. His wife, at that time, Erkanesh, once fasted for four days a week for eight months straight. She literally, literally, thousands upon thousands of people have been baptized in Jesus' name, have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and seen the truth of the oneness of the Godhead uh, because of their sacrifices and the outpouring of the Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you, revival costs something today, all right? Uh, Nobody's just going to tiptoe into revival. It it costs you some days without food. It costs you some many hours of prayer. And, and, And this is probably, I dare say, the greatest, certainly one of the greatest revivals since the early book of Acts church. And many Trinitarians would receive stern warnings from God uh, not to reject his name. For example, one night in prayer, uh, um, um, uh, his his testimony was that the Lord told him, again, a long time ago now, but told him that, 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 uh, that he was to take the truth back to the churches that he used to pastor and to take Jesus' name, baptism, back to him. And so he did, and he went to a man by the name of Alaro's house one night and was talking to Alaro, and he said that, said that while he was eating and talking to him, he began to exposit and expound upon him the truths of Jesus' name, baptism. And this man became very agitated and, and jumped up from the table and said, look, because there's no lodging in this village tonight, you can stay here tonight. But in the morning, uh, I want you to leave here, he said, because I don't want to hear that Jesus' name, baptism stuff around here. And so he, to- he told uh, Tecla Merriam that, and, and, but what Alaro didn't know was that God had some more plans overnight while he was sleeping. 
And while he was sleeping, his testimony is that all of a sudden, the light, in the middle of the night, that the, the, the great light shone in his room and that there was a man standing in all white in the room. And he spoke to him and he said, do not resist the life-giving message that you heard from Tecla Merriam tonight, nor stand in the way of the, those that would enter therein. The man fell on his face. He wept before God till 5 a.m. in the morning and was beaten on Tecla Merriam's door the next morning to say, and bring me down to the water and baptize me in Jesus. Now, I'm just telling you, if God be for you, who can be against you? In fact, Harry, Harry Sism, who was the, I think he was the uh, foreign, uh, I think he was the uh, uh, foreign missionary head at that time. He, he, he came back to America and, and he said, you would just have to go there and see it for yourself. He said, you just couldn't believe it. You, you just have to see it. And this book records the account of a husband and wife in the 1930s by the name of Aspa and Salome. They resided in the capital there uh, called Addis Ababa. It's the capital there in Ethiopia. And uh, one day, Salome saw an older white man uh, with white hair and a long snowy beard circling the property and calling out her husband's name. Aspa, Aspa, Aspa kept just calling out his name. Well, obviously, she doesn't know who this man is. And, and, and finally, he, he entered into the, to her, the, the uh, backyard through a fence and just sat down in a chair. And Salome cautiously approached him and walked up to him. And, and as he approached, uh, as she approached, rather, he said to her, my name is Alfred. David, I am a servant of Jesus Christ, who is the one true God. He spoke to me in my own country of Holland and told me to travel to Ethiopia and tell the people of this land who he is and that he wants to live in their hearts by the power of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. He told me to come to Asphalt's house, and it has taken me nearly two years to walk here. I call, I, this is what I asked Sister Freeman about. You know, this is, some of this going to, and, and I asked her, she said, yes, Brother Perkins, everybody knows the old Dutchman there. And, and, and in fact, in the second book, uh, I've seen a picture of him in her uh, subsequent book. I think it's entitled, uh, Then Came the Glory. Uh, you, there's actually a picture of him in the, in the front of the book. And he, he was, he, she, he spoke a mixture of, of Dutch, Arabic, German, and English. Well, this couple felt like this man was genuinely sent from God. And so they built a small room on the front of his of their porch, and he ended up living with them until his death and just basically became integrated into the family. He would often scold the Ethiopian people for believing in a trinity. He would say to them, the Muslims are wiser than you. At least they know there's only one person in the Godhead. He would repeatedly tell them that literally. Uh, this, all this was later told to uh, the missionary by Salome's teenage grandson by the name of Ayala. And, and when, when he was called to eat, the old Dutchman would, and when they would ask him to say grace, he would very often get lost in the spirit, just worshiping God and, and speaking in a heavenly language. And the family would eat in silence and finish leave, leaving the man still worshiping God. He, he, he would kneel upon the grass hour upon hour upon hour in prayer and praise and would suddenly lift up his eyes to the heavens and shout with a loud voice, welcome Spirit of God. Welcome, Spirit of God. One day Salome saw the old Dutchman uh, staggering and, and, and falling around the yard in the house, and she thought he was having a heart attack or a stroke, but he kept resisting, saying, don't take me to the hospital. I'm not sick. And he was just lost in praise and worship. Well, they made him go to the, made him go to the hospital, and, and, and as God would have it, there happened to be a Dutch nurse that waited on him, and, and she came out and she explained to uh, to Salome, she, she said, he is not sick. The power of the Most High God is upon him. The Lord has made him many wonderful promises. He says that the name of Jesus will soon rise over Ethiopia, brighter, mightier than the noonday sun. This, of course, is a fulfillment of prophecy, of the prophecy that we just read in the book of Psalm. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Once a year, every year, the man would fast for 40 days. At the close 
because of one of those fasts, he came out of his little room, uh, leaping and prophesying mightily and worshiping God, just ecstatic in his spirit. And he turned to them and he said, a mighty revival is going to sweep across Ethiopia. Great miracles will be done in the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost will be poured out upon you all. He then turned to Ayala, Salome's young grandson, who later relayed all of this to sister, brother and sister Freeman at that time. And he said, you, my son, will be filled with the Holy Spirit and become a preacher of the gospel. Some years later, the young man, Ayala, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in a prayer meeting with Tecla Merriam in the old man's room and just a just a prayer meeting. And and, and, and then then this man settled in his spirit and foretold his soon bloody death. Eight months later, around 1968 or so to 70, he was walking through town and a car struck him and his blood flowed into the gutter. And it was just a few years later that a mighty revival of Jesus name baptism and the Holy Ghost hit like a flood. But what I'm here to tell us tonight is the great God of heaven used people that were willing to forsake all in order that they might find him. I'm just going to tell us one more time. Revival comes with a price. Nobody's just going to fill these pews by not fasting and by not praying and by not having a consecrated prayer life. One scholar said it has yet to be seen what God can do with a man or a woman who was 100 entirely percent committed to him. But I'm going to tell you that David was on the right track when he said, Early will I seek him. My soul thirsts for you, God. I long for you, God. I don't care, God, about what this one's doing and that one. I just want you, God. You're what I'm after, God. I want to say, I said it the other day. You know you can be loyal to the house of God and not be loyal to the God of the house. I'm going to tell you something. I need the house of God, but more importantly, I need the God of the house. David said, I want to see your power. I want to see your glory. My soul follows hard after you. Hey, look at what he accomplished. Look at how he was rewarded openly for his private consecrations. Slew the lion and the bear with his own hands by the power of God. The story of Goliath, uh, the king of Israel, man after God's own heart, had many, many victories, furnished most of the gold and the silver for the temple, Solomon's uh, temple. I'm just telling you that he he was rewarded openly for his private consecrations. Well, I'm going to tell you where his great revival began was many, many, many hours all alone on the backside of a pastor somewhere writing the book of Psalm and worship and praise to God. Just one on one experience. And, and he understood the principle. In fact, I think he's the one that wrote it. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Hebrew word for dwells means to remain. I'm just going to tell you it's more than church just three times a week. It's more than just going through the motions of Christianity and of Pentecost. But I'm talking about those that are willing to forsake all in order that you might find Him. you got to have a relationship with God. you got to find that secret place with God. And you got to stay there. you got to remain there. Not being super spiritual, but I'm just telling you, you need to have a private relationship with God. Abraham, boy, if you're going to find me, i got to get you away from all the crowds. Joseph, i got a lot of great things in store for you, boy. But first, got to get you all by yourself. i got to get you away from the crowds. i got to put you in isolation. And you'll go from isolation to isolation. Because it's going to take an isolation. It's going to take an isolated private consecration, Joseph, before I'm ever going to use you in public. Let me just say right here, God never calls anybody to preach until he calls them to pray. And if they're not praying, I don't want to hear them preaching. Oh, praise the Lord, somebody. Moses, you're going to lead a great revival, but first you're going to spend 40 years with me all alone on the backside of a desert somewhere in Midian. Jeremiah, you're going to find me all right, but it'll be when you search for me with all of your heart. I'm going to say it again. It's more than church two or three times a week. It's got to be in your heart. Man. 
Oh, God, can I just be transparent here? Just yesterday, I, uh, I had a talking to a pastor, a friend of mine. He's, uh, you know, telling me, well, this preacher says this, and that preacher says this. For 30 minutes on the phone, this preacher says this, and that preacher says this. And I just hung up the phone. I, I told my wife we was going to go to Coronado for a little bit. And I said, you know what? I said, you go back there in, in that back room. I'm going to go in this room right here. I said, let's just have a prayer meeting for a little while. And, and I just went in there. I just got on my face before God. I said, God, I get so sick of being wrapped up in what this one's doing, what that one's doing, what that I don't care what they're doing. I just need you, God. I just, I'm not going to let nothing take me away from my focus on you, God. And people are so wrapped up in what this preacher's doing and that preacher's doing and what this one's doing. I don't care. I just care about you, God. I just need a relationship with you. I'm not going to let nobody or nothing distract me from my relationship with God. I remember, Lord, I'm being too transparent. I remember when I was a new convert. I came around. I didn't know nothing, but but I came around and 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 they had a had a bunch of uh. Whew. I to get in trouble. But I had a bunch of bunch of single ladies around the church that I that that, that I that I prayed through in many years ago and now and, and and they would sit around. I'm just telling you, they would sit around and talk about this one and talk about that one and talk about. And I was a new convert and I didn't know anything, but I'd sit there and I'd hear that stuff. And again, I didn't know nothing, but I'd leave and I'd go to my little apartment down there and I'd get on my face and I'd say, God, I don't know a whole lot, but I know these people are so wrapped up in church that it's not. Not even about you. It's about the church of God, but it's not about the God of the church. And I used to pray, God, don't ever let me get like that. God, please keep me from that kind of an attitude. God, please don't let me be so wrapped up in the church of God that I forget about the God of the church. I'm telling you, I don't worship the church. I don't worship Pentecost. I don't worship standards. I don't worship. I worship Jesus. I need Jesus Christ to give me help. And I'm not going to let nothing distract me from Him. And it's not because I'm spiritual, it's because I'm carnal. Well, praise the Lord. I don't pray because I'm super spiritual. I pray because I've got flesh. And if I don't keep this flesh nailed to the tree, He'll resurrect Himself and He'll let me know He's there. And so I've got to keep Him... Oh, come on, somebody. I've got to keep Him nailed to the tree because the power of God is not released in your life until your flesh is nailed to the tree. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. I flesh goes away because then the Holy Ghost will be poured out upon you. Hey, if you want the Holy Ghost poured out, learn how to push that plate back every now and then. Learn how to pray. Learn how to fast. Keep that flesh subdued. I am crucified with Christ. And so we talk a whole lot about Brother Verbal Bean, don't we? Let me tell you about Elder Verbal Bean. Verbal Bean was known to have all night prayer meetings by himself as a 12 year old boy. Twelve-year-old boy would lock himself in the church house and pray all night long. Now, if it's a lie, he told it, and I doubt he has told a lie. Or I saw where he said it out of his own out of his own mouth. My grandpa used to pray with verbal. Bit. I'm just telling you, brother. The man was a praying man, and you think God ever used him in public? I think he might have a little bit, but it came first with a private consecration, and many, 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 many years of that private consecration also. I know a preacher friend of mine who told me one time, he said, look, he said, I was, uh, said I was over in, I think he said Phoenix. He was at a wedding in the Phoenix area. He said he's in a, at a wedding there and, and said the pastor pulled him aside and he said, hey, he said, you see that young man over there? He said, every morning the, 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 the youth group meets here around 5 to 6 a.m., somewhere around there, for, for a prayer meeting every morning. And he said, we don't know what time he gets here. We don't know if he sleeps. We don't know. So, but that young man, every night, his car is in the parking lot of this church. And that young man is at this church all night long, every night. You know who that, that young man is? Tecla Merriam's son. Well, I wonder where he picked up that spirit of prayer at. I wonder where he picked up that consecration at. I'm just telling you, you can sow some things into your children. You can sow some things into a youth. You can sow some things into them daughters and into them sons. You can sow prayer. You can sow holiness. You can sow godliness. You can sow righteous living. You can sow doctrine. They'll listen and look to you. I, 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 Lord have mercy, let me tell off on myself right here. 
I can remember as a new convert, I used to work in, in, the, in the construction field, and I can remember nine o'clock uh, breaks. Uh, I was in that little, little stinky porta potty that they got. I'd go in there and I'd get on my knees and I'd pray. Twelve o'clock, uh, I'd be back there and on them little stinky porta potties on my knees uh, praying. Uh, three o'clock, I'd be back there praying. After church, I'd go home. Uh, I'd take a shower. I'd go down. I'd rather after work and I'd go down to the church uh, and I'd pray. I'm talking about pray, 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 pray. You gotta pray to keep this place down. And it's not because I'm super spiritual. I'm not tooting my heart. I'm just saying it takes prayer. Private prayer. One-on-one prayer. Anybody know what it is to touch God one-on-one? It's one thing to touch Him in the church. It's another thing to touch Him one-on-one. Anybody know what it is to come into a church house and bury your face between two pews until you feel Jesus Christ, the day spring from on high, come down and His sweet, sweet presence is there? I read a book some time back called, the name of it is Praying Hyde. <laughs> Literally. The man's, the man's name is John Hyde. And they called the name of Praying Hyde. And I don't agree with all of his doctrines, not by any way, shape, or form. Uh, but the man did have a hunger for God. And let, let me explain that to you for a moment here. If people say, well, how can God use people that are in false doctrine? Whatsoever amount of faith anybody wherever demonstrates in the Word of God, God will honor that amount of faith that they show in the Word of God. If they, if they demonstrate faith in the gifts of the Spirit, God can use them in that. If they demonstrate faith in healing, God can use them in that. And if they just demonstrate faith in Acts 2.38, God would honor that too. But if they don't demonstrate faith in that, God's not bound by His Word to honor that. And so this man was hungry for God. And in the biography, I read where, where that uh, one, one, they were, he was a missionary to India. And, and he was over there and his, his roommate said, they were living and staying in dorms over there. And his roommate said that, uh, he said, one night, he said, I was up all night. And he said, I was sick. He said, so I was up. He said, and across the hallway was John Hyde's room. And he said, I noticed that every other hour of the night, John High's little, that, that little coal oil lamp was coming on every other hour of the night. So I said, what in the world is he doing? And he kept looking over there and, you know, every other hour of the night, his, his, his light would come on for a little while and it'd go out. And he kept looking. He said, finally, around 4 a.m., he made out John's silhouette. And John Hyde was getting up every other hour of the night and getting on his knees and seeking the face of God. Without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Without being baptized in Jesus. I'm telling you, we're going to stand in judgment someday. And I don't want it ever to be said that somebody in false doctrine did more, did more than what I did for God. And if they were seeking God, if they had a hunger for God without Jesus' name baptism and without the truth, brother, how much more are we to whom much is given? Much shall be required. And we've been given a whole lot. And a whole lot's required of us. We've been given His Word. We've been given His blood. We've been given His name. We've been given His spirit. We've been given holiness. We've been given a whole lot. And it's going to cost us a whole lot. I'm talking about forsaking all that you might find Him. I heard where Brother Jonathan Alviar told this story one time. He said, said that, you know, of course, we know he was raised as a uh, missionary in the, in, on the streets of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Over in Brazil. And said that... Uh, he said that he can remember being, when he was a boy, he said he can remember his daddy preaching on the oneness of the Godhead. And people would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, sitting it right in the pew where they were sitting. He didn't need no altar call. They just hungry for God. And God would baptize them with the Holy Ghost, just sitting right there as the spirit of revelation would, would go through that building. said he can remember communion services with, with, with people strewn out all night long on their faces before God. What none of this... Ten minutes stuff and a few crocodile tears and we're on the way out the door to, to watch the fireworks. Brother, they, they were on fire for God. They were hungry for God. And they would stay on their face all night long seeking God. Brother Alviar said he went back some years ago to, to see the building, that old storefront where his daddy was at. 
said that they have now torn down the building, said it's just houses, uh, warehouse and construction equipment and so forth, and said that he sat there looking at that, said the locals came to him, and the locals told him that whenever they went in and began to demolition the building and began to tear down the cinder blocks off of one another, said that the people began to hear the voices of people weeping and of people praying and of people worshiping, said it scared them half to death. They aborted the work. It took them six months to get anybody back in there to complete the work. I'm telling you, if the glory of God seeped into them walls over there, the glory of God will seep into these walls right here in Chula Vista, California, or in Texas, or anywhere God can find a hungry heart. God's no respect of persons. And what He did over there, He'll do for you. But sir, ma'am, it's in your hands. you got to stir up the gift that is within you. you got to have a hunger for more. I we read in Luke chapter 5 where that his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, Bible said that and when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. And followed him. What kind of a drawing magnetism did this man Jesus Christ have that they didn't even know him? And he just walks by them and he says, hey, you follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And all of a sudden they just say, hey, I don't know what it is in this man. He wasn't just man, but he was God also. But they are willing to walk away from their profession, walk away from their careers, walk away from everything. Man, I never thought of this. But let me tell somebody right here, don't you ever put your job over Jesus Christ. Christ. Don't you ever put nothing about Jesus Christ. Don't put your schooling about Jesus. Don't put your job against you over Jesus. Nothing. Hey, well, I feel led of God to go somewhere. You better check it out with your pastor first. I'm just telling you, don't put nothing above Jesus. And what was their reward? Well, I see a Mount of Transfiguration. I see them boys uh, uh, marching up that mountain. I see a little sweat. Probably a few blisters here and there. Probably a little blood every now and then from the rocks cutting them. Their aching legs. Understand now they're a long ways away from the crowds. They're a long ways off from frivolity. They're a long ways off. Uh, there is no choir now. There is no drum beat now. There is no organ now. There is no piano now. There is no church service to help them along now. It's just them and Jesus. They're just one-on-one with Jesus. And all of a sudden, the true tabernacle, which God pitched and not man, rolled back the veil of His flesh, and they peered into the Holy of Holies, and they saw what no one had seen before. But at first, they had to get all along with Him. First, they had to be willing to forsake everything to get along with Him. And I'm telling you, they saw Elijah, they saw Moses, they saw they they saw Jesus Christ roll back the veil of his flesh. But first, they had to forsake everything. Oh, I hope I'm preaching tonight to people that is willing to forsake everything in order that you might sell out and find God totally. You just might catch a glimpse of His splendor. You just might catch a glimpse of His glory. There's no telling what He will do if you'll just let Him roll back the veil tonight. And in Matthew chapter 19, the apostle Peter said, look, let me, let me ask you something here, God. I mean, what's in this thing for us? I mean, we've forsaken all. We and followed you. What shall we have therefore? I mean, is there anything in this for us? And, and, and Jesus said, let me tell you something, old boy. Everyone that has forsaken houses, brothers, wife, mother, and children and land for my name's sake shall inherit eternal life. He was saying, yeah, there's something in it for you. It's called eternal life. You'll be with me forever and ever and ever. I personally believe we'll see our loved ones again. I personally believe we'll recognize them. Peter and John recognized, recognized Moses and they had never met Moses. But they recognize the saints of God. And if that's true of somebody they never met, how much more will it be true of us here? Of people that we knew, that we lived with, that we want telling you, if you want to see your loved ones again, they're in heaven. You better hold fast to that which you've got. And someday we'll see them again. Someday, but more importantly than that, someday we'll see Jesus. And Jesus is telling them, he's saying, let me tell you something, boys, when you forsake all, you'll find me. But he's also saying, the closer you walk with me, the lonelier you're going to be. In fact, people will think you're strange sometimes. 
might think you're a little eccentric, might think you're even... Uh, maybe even appear a little bit rude sometimes. It's not really that. Understand, you're just going deeper into your own personal Gethsemane prayer garden. You're just finding that secret place of supplication and, 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 of, and, and, and of lamentation and of travail and the things of society and modernism stand in contrast to the mind of the Spirit. And you really don't care about running here and running there all the time. You really don't, are not interested in all it You're just interested. You're like David who said, my soul thirsts for you, God. It's you that I want. You're like Paul who said, Paul who had the equipment of two Ph.D. degrees by the time that he was 25 years old. He said, what things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them rubbish that I might win Christ. You think Paul had a little bit of a reward for that private consecration? I seem to see a man called up to the third heavens who heard things he couldn't even come back to earth and even utter because Paul attended upon the Lord without distraction. And I'm telling you, there are great rewards for a private consecration for a man or a woman who knows what it is to get all alone with Jesus when nobody's looking and they're not doing it for the pastor and they're not doing it for their fellow believer and they're not doing it for other saints and they're not, oh, come on now, but they're doing it because they have a relationship with Him. They don't get mad when somebody preaches against worldliness. Oh, praise the Lord. They don't get mad and feel led of God to go somewhere else. Because, you know, it's just a little different around there. Oh, no, brother. They're sold out to God. You can't preach it too hard for somebody that's sold out to God. You can't name it and claim it too hard for somebody that's sold out to God. I'm just telling you, brother. The Ethiopians over there, I read this too. They, they, one thing that they try their hardest to get away from. This is where old... Oh, technically kind of dropped the ball in many places, but this is one of, one of them, is that they, 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 they fight against disunity. Disunity. I was preaching a revival for Brother Brent Cross White in Nacogdoches, Texas, good friend of mine. And I was preaching a revival for him. I'll never forget this one day. Now, look, you know, I'm not one of these cats that hears from God every other day, all right? I'm just telling you, some people hear from God more than Moses did, all right? You're around somebody, what, the, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I just, every time I hear that. Uh, but this one time, I was uh, praying there one day, and, and I'll never forget this. I was walking the floor and praying, and, and, and I came around, and, the old, and he was in the old building at that time, and, and, and I walked around the, the corner, and I was just thinking about this. I was walking the floor, and I was praying, and, and, and I just had a fleeting thought that came across my mind, and it said, if the preachers in America would preach just as hard against God, Gossip, uh, discord, and disunity as they do against television. The American church would be a whole lot better off. I'm telling you, this old boy here is against television and Hollywood. But I'm also against gossip. I'm also against backbiting. I'm also against hatred. I'm also against malice. I'm also against bitterness by which many are defiled. And I'm not saying I'm, that I'm exempt from it. I'm well aware of my weaknesses. But I'm telling you, brother, we don't have to. You know, we're so focused on the external sometimes. We'll forget the internal holiness is inside and outside it's, it's not just this it's this but it's more than this well praise the Lord and so I, I'm, I'm just telling you that the and, and the Ethiopians have, have convinced themselves I read where Sister Freeman wrote this they have convinced themselves that they can win at least I don't remember how many souls it is it's more than one, all right? I, I, I want to say it's like a hundred. It's, it's way out there. They have convinced themselves they can win X amount of souls every week. Every week. They are just eat up with zeal when it comes to outreach. Truly humble people. Tr Boy, there's a lot I want to say about true humility. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of times that, 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 that pride comes draped in the garments of humility. You understand? There's such a thing as false humility. I want the real humility, brother. I don't want there to be no facade about me. I don't, that's one thing I like about this man and his wife. There is no facade there, brother. Humble people. And they could be proud and lifted up if they wanted to be, but they're not. I'm telling you, I want true humility in my heart. And these people are, 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 are humble people and God smiles upon unity and humility and clean godly living. 
And some years ago, and I'm, I'm almost done, but some, some, some years ago, show you how God works. Some years ago, I remember, I was on a longer fast, and nobody in the world knew this. Nobody knew about this. And I've been fasting all throughout the week. Broke the fast on a Friday day. Went to church that night. I think I broke it around noon. Went to church that night, a little home missions work in Mississippi. I walked in and just sat down. Good many people there. They had it. Had it going pretty good and just walked in to sit on the pew and just going to listen to the preaching of the word of God. And the preacher got up and got to preaching. And while he was preaching, he walked straight up to me and he said, man, I don't know much about you. He said, but when you walked in here tonight, he said, the Lord showed me your face and said his faithfulness is rewarded. And not nobody in this world knew I had just broken up. Brother Perkins, you're lifting yourself up. No, I'm not. I'm trying to show you that what God does in Brazil and what God does in Ethiopia, God can do in America. Right here among us. Uh, We hear about this stuff somewhere. Oh, well, that's over there. No, it can be right here if you want it to be. If there's a hunger in your heart. I'm, I'm trying to bring it to a landing, but we've heard about... The great Azusa Street Revival, Azusa and William Seymour and and, and, and all of that. Well, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but William Seymour, without the Holy Ghost in Louisiana, was a praying man, hungry man, just hungry for God. He he, he was just hungry for God. His testimony is that after much prayer, that one day the Holy Ghost spoke to him audibly, he says, and said to him after many, 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 many years of praying, Five hours a day. He would pray five hours a day. He said that the Holy Ghost audibly spoke to him and said, William, William, I have many great things in store for you, but it's going to take more prayer. So he upped it. It's around seven to eight hours per day. Had to spread it out throughout the day and, 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 and upped it out. And do you think God ever used that man over in Azusa Street? I know there's a lot of buffoonery that came out later. But at one time, at one time, though, they had it going on. You hear me? There, there are reports of the whole congregation singing in unison in tongues completely. Because those people were praying. They said he would stick his head in the old milk crate, milk crate deals there. And, and wouldn't come. he would stay there for hour upon hour when he felt like it. It was time to come out. He'd come out. What happened first? Private consecration. That's what happened first. I'm trying to preach to us tonight. And if you want victory publicly, you got to be consecrated privately. If you can't just come to church two, three times a week and they go, oh, everything's all right. No, 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 no. It's got to be a relationship with God. Smith Wigglesworth was called the Apostle of Faith. Now, again, I don't agree with his doctrines. I don't embrace everything that he does in any way, shape, or form or that he believed. But he did have a hunger for God, and that I I certainly respect. And he was called the apostle of faith because blind eyes would be opened. Cancers falling off. Deaf ears literally unstopped. He was at a preacher's meeting once, and they all got up, and and, and they all gave their little glory hallelujah, and, and they asked him up last, and... And, and he got up, and the history says that when he began to pray, that the glory and the weight of God's presence began to fall and to descend. And as it descended so mightily, mightily, that one by one, the preachers began to leave. And history says some actually literally crawled out the door trying to get out. Until only he by himself stood there. You know why? He was accustomed to such manifestations of God's presence. He had already been there in private. I'm just telling us, brother. And, and so he, he, he was interviewed once and they asked him, what is the secret of, of uh, why, why do you have such success, Mr. Wigglesworth? He began to weep and he made this statement that so impacted me when I read it. He said, I sail the high seas of life alone. Ever since my wife died, I am a very lonely man, he said. He just spent so much time one on one all alone with God and God. God used him mightily, all because he spent so much time alone with God in private. And God said, I can bless that person publicly because what they did in secret. Hey, you enter into your prayer closet and what you do in private, God will reward thee openly. But if you're not doing it in private.
it. I don't care if you know how to how to suck and jive and know how to do all that. I'm telling you, you, you can't suck and jive over an unconsecrated life. There's got to be a consecration privately. And you can always tell a praying man. You can always tell a, a praying lady when you're around them for five minutes. I'm telling you it for me in my house, brother. I've got to have Jesus in my heart. I don't care about just being a Pentecostal. I want to be a Christian. I need God. I need God to help me. Uh, and I'm finished, but I'm, I want to tell you this right here. If I didn't come to the music, they want to. But listen to me. Listen to me. I'm not done quite. Listen. I know a man right now. He, at one time, I think he still does. If I called his name, just about everybody in here would know. No, I'm not. At one time, he would pray. I know this for a fact. I'm very close to this man. He would pray, and or he would go on a seven-day fast once a year. He did that. Every three months, he three-day fast. Once a week, one-day fast. Praying man, consecrated man in private. He was in Louisiana preaching a revival many years ago. I can't remember the guy. I'm going to say Jenner, but I, I can't remember the name of the pastor right now. But he, he was down there, and he was preaching a revival. And he told me, he said, Brother Perkins... I was in there. He said, and man, that place was rocking. You hear me? About like it does around here. And, and he, he said, I mean, the power of God was, was there and everybody was. He said, there was a lady there by the name of Tina. He said, Tina had just uh, about three, four days before that, had her van had flipped four times at least. And he said, Tina was wheeled in in a wheelchair. She had a broken ankle, had a broken femur bone, had a broken pelvis, and had a broken vertebrae. She was in bad shape. You hear me? But that lady and her faithfulness said, just wheel me to the house of God. And, and she came to, the, came to church. This brother told me, he said, brother, during worship service, they were just worshiping and, and all that. He said, I didn't even feel led to go pray for her. He said, I just saw she had a knee. He said, I walked back there and he said, when I laid my hands on her, he said, nothing. I didn't see no light or nothing. No angel behind her. He said, I just laid my hands on her. He said, the moment my hands touched her, he said, she shot out of that wheelchair and began running the aisles. God had immediately fused her together. But it took a man that knew what it was to get along with God first. It took a man that knew what it was to push the plate back and to fast and to pray and to fast and to pray and to fast and to pray. I hope I'm preaching to a church tonight that wants that, that you have a hunger in your heart and says, God, I'm willing to forsake all. And what reward will you have? Man, there'll be glory. There'll be power. There'll be victory in your heart. Come on, church. Let's stand right now. And so last night, late last night, I'm reading and I'm reading where... Moses is standing and he's talking to Yahweh, speaking to him out of the burning bush. Listen to me. I'm not done. Listen. And he's there. And God tells Moses, he says, put down that staff. You know the story. It becomes a serpent. Why didn't it become a lamb? He says, now stick your hand in there. It becomes white as leprosy. It becomes leprous. Why didn't God cover it with His Shekinah glory? I'd never thought of this before. I read it and I thought, something's going on here. And I mused on that today and I prayed about that day and I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it. You know, Moses, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. The emblem of the world. The symbol of the world. Bondage. My people who have had my name, uh, 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 who, who are the people of my name, he, you're going to lead them out of Egypt in route to Canaan. Now, I know Canaan is a type of the Holy Ghost, but I believe it's also a type of heaven. I've heard people fight and say, oh, no, it's not a type of heaven because they had giants in there and there are enemies in, in, in Canaan. And there's no enemies in heaven. Listen, types are just that. They're types. They're not exact replicas. That's why they're called a type. Praise the Lord. And so Canaan, a type of the Holy Ghost and a type of, type of heaven. And Moses, emblem of Christ. Moses, you're going to lead my people out. And Moses, 
I'm not going to turn this staff into a lamb, but I'm going to turn it into the into the emblem of something that's going to cause you fear and trouble. The Bible said he fled immediately whenever it became turned that turned into the serpent. And then God said to Moses, pick it back up. Moses, this trouble that you're facing in route from Egypt to heaven, this trouble that you're going through, I'm going to, you can trust me through this trouble, Moses. Moses, take out your hand, put it in there and take it out. It's not now going to be filled with glory. I don't want to give you the impression, Moses, that everything's going to be hunky-dory on the way from Egypt to heaven, on the way from Egypt to Canaan. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be things that cause you fear, Moses. But Moses, put your hand back in there, boy. What I'm trying to teach you, Moses, is that you can trust me when you're on your way from Egypt, from the world to heaven. And what things were written beforehand were written for our admonition, for our learning. And I'm telling somebody tonight, you can trust Him on the way from Egypt, on the way from this world, in your journey to heaven. He'll meet you there. He does not remove the trouble, but He makes sure to go through the trouble with you. Moses, I'm teaching you to trust me, boy. And if it was a lamb, or if everything was fine, Moses, wherein would you learn to trust me? Let's lift our hands right now, can we? Come on. Anybody? Anybody willing to forsake all tonight? Oh, I know it's a Tuesday night Bible study, but I wonder if there's any old Dutchman in the house tonight. Is there any Pauls here? Is there any David here? Is there any old Dutchman from Ethiopia willing to come away from everything? You're willing to forsake it all? The hem of your God. <laughs> and I come on. Just going through the motions is not going to get it done. But today, my <laughs> God, it'll be worth everything to see your face, to see your glory. Come on, church. 